death. The case of departing employees many of the thorniest issues in trade secret and contract law arise when employees leave a company in order either to start their own business or to take a job elsewhere. Such cases present a fundamental clash of rights between an employee's mobility and ability to pursue gainful employment and a former employer's protection of its trade secrets. Judge Adams captures the tradeoff in the following excerpt from C. Handling Systems v. Eli, 753 F. 2nd 1244, 1266-69, 3rd C. 1985, Adams, J., concurring, when deciding the equitable issue surrounding the request for a trade secret injunction. It would seem that a court cannot act as a pure engineer or scientist, assessing the technical import of the information in question. Rather, the court must also consider economic factors, since the very definition of trade secret requires an assessment of the competitive advantage a particular item of information affords to a business. Similarly, among the element to be weighed in determining trade secret status are the value of the information to its owner and to competitors, and the ease or difficulty with which the information may be properly acquired or duplicated. While the majority may be correct in suggesting that the trial court need not always engage in extended analysis of the public interest, the court on occasion must apply the element of sociology. This is so, since trade secret cases frequently implicate the important countervailing policy served on one hand, by protecting a business person from unfair competition stemming from the usurpation of trade secrets, and on the other, by permitting an individual to pursue unhampered the occupation for which he or she is best suited. Trade secrets are not so important to society that the interests of employees, competitors, and competition should automatically be relegated to a lower position whenever trade secrets are proved to exist. Robertson, The Confidence Game, An Approach to the Law About Trade Secrets, 25 Errors. L. Reverend 347, 382, 1983. These observations take on more force, I believe, when a case such as the present one involves the concept of know-how. Under Pennsylvania law an employee's general knowledge, skill, and experience are not trade secrets. Thus in theory an employer generally may not inhibit the manner in which an employee uses his or her knowledge, skill, and experience even if these were acquired during employment. When these attributes of the employee are inextricably related to the information or process that constitutes an employer's competitive advantage as increasingly seems to be the case in newer, high technology industries the legal questions confronting the court necessarily become bound up with competing public policies. It is noteworthy that in such cases the balance struck by the Pennsylvania courts apparently has favored greater freedom for employees to pursue a chosen profession. The courts have recognized that someone who has worked in a particular field cannot be expected to forego the accumulation skills, knowledge, and experience gained before the employee changes jobs. Such qualifications are obviously very valuable to an employee seeking to sell his services in the marketplace. A person leaving one employer and going into the marketplace will seek to compete in the area of his or her greatest aptitude. In light of the highly mobile nature of our society, and as the economy becomes increasingly comprised of highly skilled or high-tech jobs, the individual's economic interests will more and more be buffeted by competitive advantage. Courts must be cautious not to strike a balance that unduly disadvantages the individual worker. In my view a proper injunction necessarily would impose the minimum restraint upon the free utilization of employee skill consistent with denying unfaithful employees an advantage from misappropriation of information. Thus, as I see it, the district court, on remand, should fashion an injunction that extends only so long as it is essential to negate any unfair advantage that may have been gained by the appellants. The majority opinion in C-Handling partially upheld a finding that two former employees had misappropriated trade secrets, but advocated an injunction against them in order for the district court to reconsider its scope. Departing employee cases constitute over two-thirds of all trade secret cases. See David S. Almerling, and others, a statistical analysis of trade secret litigation in state courts. 46 Gons. L. Reverend 57, 60, 2011. This section explores the thorny issues surrounding the parting issues. Section 1 discusses restrictions on disclosure of a company's information, trade secret and otherwise, following employment. Section 2 addresses ownership of employee inventions. Section 3 examines the enforceability of non-competition agreements. Section 4 discusses the enforceability of non-solicitation agreements. 1. Confidentiality and use of trade secrets Nearly all companies require their employees to sign a confidentiality, or non-disclosure, agreement. These agreements generally recite that the employee will receive confidential information during their employment, and that they undertake to keep such information secret and not to use it for anyone other than the employer. Such agreements are essential to the establishment of trade secret protection serving as a relatively low-cost effort to prevent disclosure and are generally enforceable against current and former employees. Even if there is no express non-disclosure agreement, some courts imply one. In Winston Research Corp v 3 Meter Co., 350 F. 2nd 134, 9th C. 1965, the court dismissed an argument that an employee owed no obligation of confidentiality in his own inventions. Winston argues that information is protected from disclosure only if communicated to the employee by the employer who is seeking protection, and that the information involved in this case was not disclosed by three meters to the employees subsequently hired by Winston, but rather was developed by these employees themselves, albeit while employed by three meters. We need not examine the soundness of the rule for which Winston contends, or its applicability to a case such as this in which a group of specialists engaged in related facets of a single development project change their employer. 
A. An obligation not to disclose may arise from circumstances other than communication in confidence by the employer. It may also rest upon an express or implied agreement. In the present case, an agreement not to disclose might be implied from 3 meters. S. Elaborate efforts to maintain the secrecy of its development program and the employee's knowledge of those efforts and participation in them. In any event, 3 meters and its employees entered into express written agreements binding the latter not to disclose confidential information, and these agreements did not exclude information which the employee himself contributed. Ed. 140. Employers sometimes attempt to limit an employee's use of information that does not constitute a trade secret. This issue parallels the problem of restrictive license provisions raised in Chapter 2. E. Are employers limited by the intellectual property laws to protecting only trade secrets, or are they free to impose additional restrictions on their employees? Courts struggle with this issue, with the majority concluding that reasonable contract restrictions on use or disclosure of information by employees are enforceable even in the absence of a protectable trade secret. See Bernier v. Merrill Air Engineers, 770 A. 2nd 97, Maine, 2001. 12 Roger Milgram, Milgram on Trade Secrets, 3.05, left square bracket 1, at 32209-32210, 2, ownership of employee inventions I, the common law obligation, to assign inventions at common law, ownership of inventions including ownership of patent rights was determined according to an employee's status under a long line of common law employee invention cases, in general, employees fall into one of three categories, 1, employees hired to invent, which results in employer ownership of the invention, 2, employees who invent on the employer's time, or using its resources, which results in a limited, non exclusive Exclusive shop right on the part of the employer to practice the invention, and, 3, an employee's independent invention, in which case the employee owns the invention. See generally United States v. Dubilia Condenser Corp., 289 U.S. 178, 1933, John C. Stedman, Employer-Employee Relations, in Frederick Numia, the employed inventor in the United States 30, 40-41, 1971. The first category is relatively straightforward, if the employee was hired to invent, what else would the employer be buying except the resulting inventions? It seems logical to extend this treatment to consultants and others who are not employees in the strict sense. Compare, McGill Murray v. Arkansas Power and Light Co., 27 USBQ 2nd 1129, 1135 N15, Fed. C 1993, Upholding ShopRite an employer, where inventor slash patentee was a consultant, Robert P. Merges, Intellectual Property and the Costs of Commercial Exchange, a review SA, 93 Mitch. L. Reverend 1570, 1995, highlighting the role of intellectual property in structuring non-employment-based organizations, such as consulting companies and joint ventures. Category 2, reflects situations where employers have less than a complete claim to the invention, but where the employer's facilities or resources are combined with the inventor's talent and industry to produce the invention. The employee owns it, but the employer is compensated by receiving a limited right to practice the invention. Notably, however, that shop right does not include the right to sell the invention to others. Birriant v. GTE Labs Incorporated, 535 F Apps 919, Fed. C. 2013. An employee's obligation to refrain from using an employer's trade secrets looks more onerous when it is the employee who came up with the secret. In Wexler v. Greenberg, 168 second 430, Pennsylvania, 1960, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court concluded that a departing employee was entitled to take formulas he had developed at his prior employer to work for a competitor. Despite the fact that the employee, Greenberg, was the chief chemist of the plaintiff, the court concluded that he was not in fact hired to invent and therefore owned the inventions he made. The Wexler result, while it may seem fair, is not the majority rule. Even in Pennsylvania, Wexler is not always followed. See Healthcare Affiliated Services v. Lippency, 701 F Sub 1142, 1155, WD Pennsylvania, 1988, rejecting Wexler analysis, emphasizing that although defendant developed inventions on his own, he did so using knowledge and information made available by the plaintiff employer. But see Fidelity Fund v. De Santo, 500 A second 431, Sup. Court. Pennsylvania, 1985, denying recovery against ex-employee salesman partly on the basis that he developed client contacts himself during employment. Category, 3, covers cases where the employee invents on his, or her own time, outside the field of employment. See Dubalier, Supra. As the next section explains, employers sometimes seek to own such inventions through assignment agreements. I.I. Assignment agreements Many companies require their employees to assign inventions made during their employment to the employer. These agreements are generally enforceable with regard to inventions made within the scope of employment. In some cases, assignment agreements extend to all inventions made by an employee, whether or not at the employer's facilities, during work hours, or within the scope of employment. Several states proscribe such broad assignments. California Labor Code 2870 prohibits employers from requiring assignment of invention S. That the employee developed entirely on his or her own time without using the employer's equipment, supplies, facilities, or trade secret information, unless the invention relates to the employer's current or demonstrably anticipated business. Other states have similar freedom to create limitations on employer assignment agreements. C. For instance, Min. Stat. An. 181.78. 1980. N.C. General. Stat. 66-57.1-57.2, 1981, Wash, Reverend, Codan, 
1987. By contrast, Nevada Revised Statutes 600.500 automatically assigns inventions to an employer, provided they were developed in the course of employment, and relates to the scope of the employee's work, whether or not the employee signs an invention assignment agreement. Some companies afford employed inventors a bonus or financial share in inventions that they develop. See Richard S. Bruner Corporate Patents, Optimizing Organizational Responses to Innovation Opportunities and Invention Discoveries, 10 MARQ, Intel, Prop. L. Reverend 1, 3231, 30N83, 2006, Describing Bonus Award Systems, Julie L. Davis and Susan S. Harrison, Edison in the Boardroom, How Leading Companies Realize Value from Their Intellectual Assets 29, 2002, Discussing Patent Incentive Systems. Nonetheless, commentators argue that overbroad assignment agreements dull innovation incentives and undermine economic growth. See Ollie Lobel, Talent Wants to Be Free, 2014, Arguing for an Open Market for Labor, Henrik D. Parker, Reform for Rights of Employed Inventors, 57 S. Cal. L. Reverend 603, 1984, calling for federal legislation granting employed inventors greater control over, and interest in, their inventions, but see Robert P. Merges, The Law and Economics of Employee Inventions, 13 Harv. J. L. and Tech 1, 1999, defending employer ownership of inventions. Problem Problem 2nd 15. Helen, an employee of CarTech, is assigned to work on solving a particular problem in car design. She works for two years on that problem for CarTech, without success. Two months after Helen leaves CarTech to start her own company, she puts out a product that solves a problem on which she toiled without evident success at CarTech. CarTech sues Helen for misappropriation of trade secrets. At trial, CarTech proves that Helen came up with her system while at CarTech, and that she decided to start her own company to exploit her invention rather than disclose it to CarTech. As a result, CarTech had no knowledge of the idea until Helen came out with her product. CarTech did not require Helen to sign any employment or invention assignment agreement. Should CarTech prevail in its trade secret suit? I.I. Trailer clause is to discourage employees from withholding inventions made during their employment. Employers sometimes require employees to agree to a trailer clause assigning the employees inventions for a period of time after they depart. Trailer clauses are generally enforceable to the extent that they are reasonable. Clauses of particularly long or indefinite duration can be held unenforceable and run afoul of the antitrust laws. See United Shoe Machinery Co. v. Large Appel, 212 Massachusetts, 467, 99N289, 1912. One court expressed the requirement of reasonableness as follows. Holdover clauses are simply a recognition of the fact of business life that employees sometimes carry with them to new employers inventions or ideas so related to work done for a former employer that in equity and good conscience the fruits of that work should belong to that former employer. In construing and applying holdover clauses, the courts have held that they must be limited to reasonable times and to subject matter which an employee worked on or had knowledge of during his employment. Unless expressly agreed otherwise, an employer has no right under a holdover clause to inventions made outside the scope of the employee's former activities and made on and with a subsequent employer's time and funds. Dor Oliver Incorporated v. United States, 432 F. 2nd 447, 452, Court. CL 1970. Courts are skeptical of restrictions that are broader in scope. See Applied Materials Incorporated v. Advanced Micro Fabrication Equipment, Shanghai, Co. 630 S. Sub 2nd 1084, ND California, 2009, rejecting one-year trailer clause as an invalid non-compete agreement. This is particularly true of large conglomerates that attempt to require the assignment of any invention related to their diverse fields of business. See in Jersel Rand Co. v. Sivata, 110 New Jersey, 609, 542 A. 2nd 879, 896 and 6, 1988. In addition to controlling inventions made shortly after departure, employers might be able to lay claim to ideas conceived while the defendant was employed, even if those ideas aren't put into practice until years after the defendant leaves her job. See Motorola Incorporated v. Lemco Corp., 2012 WL 74319, NDL. January 10, 2012, employment agreement that required assignment of ideas as well as inventions could cover an idea developed at a former employer that wasn't turned into a patent application until five years later. Even if an employer uses an enforceable trailer clause, there is always the risk that the former employee will simply wait out the duration of the term and then conveniently announce the discovery after the trailer clause's expiration date. Courts are sometimes called upon to evaluate the credibility of such invention dates. In General Signal Corp v. Primary Flow Signal Incorporated, the former employee asserted that his breakthrough occurred invention just five days after the expiration of the six months specified in the trailer clause. The perfection of a flow meter proved to be a painstakingly intricate process involving extensive testing. It is therefore difficult to believe that after a long and distinguished career with plaintiff, Mr. Harmy and his musing five days after the trailer clause expired for the first time came up with the idea for the NTV. Although the word Eureka has allegedly been uttered by more than one inventor over the years, the concept at issue does not lend itself to such sudden discovery. The court finds that the concept of the back quote 434 patent must have existed in Mr. Harmy's mind before his employment with GSC ended. Mr. Harmy therefore violated his agreement with GSC. General Signal Corp v. Primary Flow Signal Incorporated, 1987 U.S. Distance, Lexus 6929, at asterisk 10, DRI July 27, 1987. 
3. Non-competition agreements Another way of reducing the risk that trade secrets will find their way into the hands of competitors is to limit former employees' ability to compete with the former employer at all. Employees develop personal relationships with vendors, customers, and others that are immensely useful in business. Non-competition agreements seek to prevent employees from competing with their former employer for a set period of time, or within a particular geographic scope. Such agreements, however, directly impinge upon labor mobility and the ability to pursue gainful employment. Employees' livelihoods often depend on their ability to market their skills and know-how, thereby raising critical public policy and social justice questions. States vary in their approach to enforcing such agreements. Edwards v. Arthur Anderson LLP Supreme Court of California 81 Calories. RPTR 3rd 282, California 2008, Chin, J. We granted review to address the validity of non-competition agreements in California and the permissible scope of employment release agreements. We limited our review to the following issues. To what extent does Business and Professions Code Section 16600 prohibit employee non-competition agreements? We conclude that Section 16600 prohibits employee non-competition agreements, unless the agreement falls within a statutory exception. We therefore affirm in part and reverse in part the Court of Appeal judgment. Facts in January 1997, Raymond Edwards II, Edwards, a certified public accountant, was hired as a tax manager by the Los Angeles office of the accounting firm Arthur Anderson LLP, Anderson. Anderson's employment offer was made contingent upon Edwards' signing a non-competition agreement, which prohibited him from working for, or soliciting certain Anderson clients for limited periods following his termination. The agreement was required of all managers, and read in relevant part, if you leave the firm, for 18 months, after release or resignation, you agree not to perform professional services of the type you, provided for any client on which you worked during the 18 months prior to release or resignation. This does not prohibit you from accepting employment with a client. For 12 months, after you leave the firm, you agree not to solicit, to perform professional services of the type you provided, any client of the office or offices to which you were assigned during the 18 months preceding release or resignation. You agree not to solicit away from the firm any of its professional personnel for 18 months, after release or resignation. Edwards signed the agreement. Between 1997 and 2002, Edwards continued to work for Anderson, moving into the firm's private client services practice group, where he handled income, gift, and estate tax planning for individuals and entities with large incomes and net worth. Over this period he was promoted to senior manager, and was on track to become a partner. In March 2002, the United States government indicted Anderson in connection with the investigation into Enron Corporation, and in June 2002, Anderson announced that it would cease its accounting practices in the United States. In April 2002, Anderson began selling off its practice groups to various entities. In May 2002, Anderson internally announced that HSBC USA Incorporated, a New York-based banking corporation, through a new subsidiary, Wealth and Tax Advisory Services, WTAS, would purchase a portion of Anderson's tax practice, including Edwards's group. In July 2002, HSBC offered Edwards employment. Before hiring any of Anderson's employees, HSBC required them to execute a termination of non-compete agreement Tonk in order to obtain employment with HSBC. Among other things, the Tonk required employees to inter alia, 1. Voluntarily resign from Anderson, 2. Release Anderson from any and all claims, including claims that in any way arise from or out of, are based upon, or relate to employees' employment by, association with or compensation from defendant, 3. Continue indefinitely to preserve confidential information and trade secrets, except as otherwise required by a court or governmental agency, 4. Refrain from disparaging Anderson or its related entities or partners, and, 5. Cooperate with Anderson in connection with any investigation of, or litigation against, Anderson. In exchange, Anderson would agree to accept Edwards's resignation, agree to Edwards's employment by HSBC, and release Edwards from the 1997 non-competition agreement. Edwards signed the HSBC offer letter, but he did not sign the talk. In response, Anderson terminated Edwards's employment, and withheld severance benefits. HSBC withdrew its offer of employment to Edwards. Procedural history. In the published part of its opinion, the Court of Appeal held, 1. The non-competition agreement was invalid under Section 16600, and requiring Edwards to sign the Tonka's consideration to be released from it was an independently wrongful lacked for purposes of the element of Edwards's claim for intentional interference with prospective economic advantage. Discussion A. Section 16600 under the common law, as is still true in many states today, contractual restraints on the practice of a profession, business, or trade, were considered valid, as long as they were reasonably imposed. Bosley Medical Group via Branson, Area Code 1984-161 Cal. App 3rd 284, 288, 207 calories. RPTR 477. This was true even in California. Wright v. Ryder, area code 1868, 36 California, 342, 357, relaxing original common law rule that all restraints on trade were invalid in recognition of increasing population and competition in trade. However, in 1872 California settled public policy in favor of open competition, and rejected the common law rule of reasonableness, when the legislature enacted the civil code. Today in California, covenants not to compete are void, subject to several exceptions discussed briefly below. Section 16600 states, except as provided in this chapter, every contract by which anyone is restrained from engaging in a lawful profession, trade, or business of any kind is to that extent void.
The chapter accepts non-competition agreements in the sale or dissolution of corporations. 16,601. Partnerships. Ibid. 16,602. And limited liability corporations. 16,602.5. In the years since its original enactment as Civil Code Section 1673, our courts have consistently affirmed that Section 16,600 evinces a settled legislative policy in favor of open competition and employee mobility. CD Sarvi Playhut Incorporated. Area Code 2. Treble 0. 85 Cal. App 4th 927, 933, 102 calories. RPTR 2nd 495. The law protects Californians and ensures that every citizen shall retain the right to pursue any lawful employment and enterprise of their choice. Metro Traffic Control Incorporated v Shadow Traffic Network. Area Code 1, 994, double to Cal. App 4th 853, 859, 27 calories. RPTR 2nd 573. It protects the important legal right of persons to engage in businesses and occupations of their choosing. More Life Incorporated v Perry, Area Code 1, 997, 56 Cal, App 4th 1514, 1520, 66 calories. RPTR 2nd 731, under the statute's plain meaning. Therefore, an employer cannot by contract restrain a former employee from engaging in his or her profession, trade, or business unless the agreement falls within one of the exceptions to the rule. 16,600. Point. Anderson, however, asserts that we should interpret the term restrain under section 16600 to mean simply to prohibit, so that only contracts that totally prohibit an employee from engaging in his or her profession, trade, or business are illegal. It would then follow that a mere limitation on an employee's ability to practices or her vocation would be permissible under section 16600, as long as it is reasonably based. Anderson contends that some California courts have held that section 16600 and its predecessor statutes, Civil Code former section 1673, 1674, and 1675, are the statutory embodiment of prior common law and embrace the rule of reasonableness in evaluating competitive restraints. See, for instance, South Bay Radiology Medical Associates v. Asher, Area Code 1, 990, 220 Cal, App 3rd 1074, 1080, 269 calories, RPTR 15, South Bay Radiology, 16600 embodies common law prohibition against restraints on trade, Vaco Industries Incorporated v. Vandenberg, 1992, 5 calories, App 4th 34, 47-48, 6 calories, RPTR 2nd 602, Vaco, 16600 is codification of common law reasonable restraint rule. Anderson claims that these cases show that section 16600 prohibits only broad agreements that prevent a person from engaging entirely in his chosen business, trade, or profession. Agreements that do not have this broad effect but merely regulate some aspect of post-employment conduct, for instance, to prevent raiding, employers' personnel are not within the scope of S. section 16600. As Edwards observes, however, the cases and Anderson cites to support a relaxation of the statutory rule simply recognize that the statutory exceptions to section 16600 reflect the same exceptions to the rule against non-competition agreements that were implied in the common law. We conclude that Anderson's non-competition agreement was invalid. As the Court of Appeal observed, the first challenged clause prohibited Edwards, for an 18-month period, from performing professional services of the type he had provided while at Anderson, for any client on whose account he had worked during 18 months prior to his termination. The second challenge clause prohibited Edwards, for a year after termination, from backquote soliciting, defined by the agreement as providing professional services to any client of Anderson's Los Angeles office. The agreement restricted Edwards from performing work for Anderson's Los Angeles clients, and therefore restricted his ability to practice his accounting profession. C. Thompson v. Impacts Incorporated, Area Code 2, 003, 113 Cal, App 4th 1425, 1429, 7 Calories, RPTR 3rd 427, Distinguishing Trade Route and Solicitation Cases that Protect Trade Secrets or Confidential Proprietary Information. The non-competition agreement that Edwards was required to sign before commencing employment with Anderson was therefore invalid because it restrained his ability to practice his profession. See McGill, Supra, 60 to calories second at pages 242 to 243, 40 to calories. RPTR 107, 398 p second 147. B. Ninth Circuit's narrow restraint exception Anderson asks this court to adopt the limited or narrow restraint exception to section 16600 that the Ninth Circuit discussed in Campbell v. Trustees of Lell and Stanford Jr., Univ, 9th C 1987, 817 S. Second 499, Campbell, and that the trial court relied on in this case in order to uphold the non-competition agreement. In Campbell, the Ninth Circuit acknowledged that California has rejected the common law rule of reasonableness with respect to restraints upon the ability to pursue a profession, but concluded that section 16600 only makes illegal those restraints which preclude one from engaging in a lawful profession, trade, or business. Campbell, Supra, 817. F. Second and P. 502. 
the court remanded the case to the district court in order to allow the employee to prove that the non-competition agreement at issue completely restrained him from practicing his profession, trade, or business within the meaning of section 16600, Campbell, at P503. The confusion over the Ninth Circuit's application of section 16600 arose in a paragraph in Campbell, in which the court noted that some California courts have accepted application of section 16600 backquote, where one is barred from pursuing only a small or limited part of the business, trade, or profession, Campbell. Supra, 817 F second and P 502. Anderson is correct, however, that Campbell has been followed in some recent Ninth Circuit cases to create a narrow restraint exception to section 16600 in federal court. Contrary to Anderson's belief, however, California courts have not embraced the Ninth Circuit's narrow restraint exception. Indeed, no reported California state court decision has endorsed the Ninth Circuit's reasoning, and we are of the view that California courts have been clear in their expression that section 16600 represents a strong public policy of the state which should not be diluted by judicial fiat. Scott V. Snelling and Snelling Incorporated, N.D. Cal. 1990, 732 F sub 1034, 1042. Section 16600 is unambiguous, and if the legislature intended the statute to apply only to restraints that were unreasonable or overbroad, it could have included language to that effect. We reject Anderson's contention that we should adopt a narrow restraint exception to section 16600 and leave it to the legislature, if it chooses, either to relax the statutory restrictions or adopt additional exceptions to the prohibition against restraint rule under section 16600. Disposition we hold that the non-competition agreement here is invalid under section 16600, and we reject the narrow restraint exception urged by Anderson. Non-competition agreements are invalid under section 16600 in California or even if narrowly drawn, unless they fall within the applicable statutory exceptions of section 16601, 16602, or 16602.5. We therefore affirm in part and reverse in part the court of appeal judgment, and remand the matter for proceedings consistent with the views expressed above. Underscore 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 in comprehensive technologies Intel V software artisans incorporated 3f third 730 4c 1993 CTI broadsuit for copyright infringement and misappropriation of trade secrets against a group of former employees who left the company to form a competing company which shortly thereafter came out with a new product the court concluded that the departing employees had not infringed CTI's copyrights or misappropriated any CTI trade secrets Nonetheless, the court enforced an agreement signed by one of the employees, Dean Hawks. The agreement provided that for a period of 12 months, after he left CTI, Hawks would not engage directly or indirectly in any business within the United States, financially as an investor or lender, or as an employee, director, officer, partner, independent contractor, consultant, or owner or in any other capacity calling for the rendition of personal services or acts of management, operational control, which is in competition with the business of CTI. For purposes of this agreement, the business of CTI shall be defined as the design, development, marketing, and sales of claims express, and e-dealing type PC-based software with the same functionality and methodology. The court stated the general legal standard governing covenants not to compete. Virginia has established a three-part test for assessing the reasonableness of restrictive employment covenants. Under the test, the court must ask the following questions. 1. Is the restraint, from the standpoint of the employer, reasonable in the sense that it is no greater than is necessary to protect the employer in some legitimate business interest? 2. From the standpoint of the employee, is the restraint reasonable in the sense that it is not unduly harsh and oppressive in curtailing his legitimate efforts to earn a livelihood? 3. Is the restraint reasonable from the standpoint of a sound public policy? Blue Ridge Anesthesia and Critical Care Incorporated v. Jiddick, 239 VA 369, 389 SE 2nd 467, 469, VA 1990. If a covenant not to compete meets each of these standards of reasonableness, it must be enforced. As a general rule, however, the Virginia courts do not look favorably upon covenants not to compete, and will strictly construe them against the employer. The employer bears the burden of demonstrating that the restraint is reasonable. The court found that Hawks' agreement, which prevented him from competing with CTI anywhere in the United States, was reasonable because CTI had offices, clients, or prospects in many, though not all, states throughout the country. Further, the court noted, as the individual primarily responsible for the design, development, marketing and sale of CTI's software, Hawks became intimately familiar with every aspect of CTI's operation, and necessarily acquired information that he could use to compete with CTI in the marketplace. When an employee has access to confidential and trade secret information crucial to the success of the employer's business, the employer has a strong interest in enforcing a covenant not to compete, because other legal remedies often prove inadequate. It will often be difficult, if not impossible, to prove that a competing employee has misappropriated trade secret information belonging to his former employer. On the facts of this case, we conclude that the scope of the employment restrictions is no broader than necessary to protect CTI's legitimate business interests. Comments and questions 1. The California rule set out in 16600 is the minority rule, but it is gaining broader acceptance. 
Several states have enacted, or are considering restrictions on non-compete agreements. Massachusetts, for example, requires advance notice of a non-compete before starting work, limits non-competes to 12 months duration, bans their use for certain categories of employees, including hourly workers and those fired or laid off, and requires the employer to pay garden leave to former employees who can't work. Illinois bans non-compete supplied to low-wage workers, 820 ILCS 90. Most states apply an overarching requirement of reasonableness to covenants not to compete, as the Virginia court did in CTI. Seamage. Comp. Laws 445.774a, non-competition agreement enforceable, if the agreement is reasonable as to its duration, geographical area, and type of employment or line of business. They may disagree, however, on what restrictions are reasonable. In Gateway 2000 Incorporated v. Kelly, 9F sub 2nd 790, ED Michigan 1998, the court invalidated an agreement that was similar to the one upheld in CTI. The court relied in part on the fact that the company had later adopted a less restrictive non-competition provision, suggesting that the older, broader provision was not necessary to protect its interests, and the Virginia Supreme Court has held unreasonable a non-competition agreement that prevented the defendant from working for a competitor in any capacity, rather than specifying particular positions the defendant could not take. Modern Environments Incorporated v. Stimmit, 561 SE 2nd 694, that 2002. Some courts have limited the enforcement of non-competition agreements to situations where trade secrets are likely to be used or disclosed if an employee is allowed to compete. The New York Court of Appeals, for example, took the following view. Undoubtedly judicial disfavor of these covenants is provoked by powerful considerations of public policy which militate against sanctioning the loss of a man's livelihood purchasing associated v-weeds. Indeed, our economy is premised on the competition engendered by the uninhibited flow of services, talent and ideas. Therefore, no restrictions should fetter an employee's right to apply to his own best advantage the skills and knowledge acquired by the overall experience of his previous employment. This includes those techniques which are, but skillful variations of general processes known to the particular trade restatement. Agency 2nd, 396 Comment B. Of course, the courts must also recognize the legitimate interest an employer has in safeguarding, that which has made his business successful and to protect himself against deliberate surreptitious commercial piracy. Thus restrictive covenants will be enforceable to the extent necessary to prevent the disclosure or use of trade secrets or confidential customer information. In addition injunctive relief may be available where an employee's services are unique or extraordinary and the covenant is reasonable. This latter principle has been interpreted to reach agreements between members of the learned professions. Read Roberts' Socks v. Strawman, 40 NY 2nd 303, 353 NE 2nd 590, Court. App 1976. Does the Reed Roberts approach in essence, hold non-competition agreements unenforceable, since it allows them to operate only when trade secret laws also provide relief? Are there sound reasons, to enforce an employer-employee agreement, that prevents the employee from competing after termination? State statutes which address the issue have generally been interpreted to allow such reasonable employee agreements, regardless of how the statutes themselves are worded. What agreements are reasonable is far from clear in this context, and is the subject of considerable litigation. Many states have invalidated non-competition agreements on the ground, that they were unreasonable. C. For instance, mutual service casualty ins. Co.V. Brass. 625 NW 2nd 648. Wiss. Court. App 2001. Brentlinger Renters v. Curran. 752 NE 2nd 994. Ohio Court. App 2001. Harvey Barnett Incorporated v. Schidler. 143 F sub 2nd 1247. D. Colorado. 2001. Mertz v. Pharmacists Mutual Inns, 625 NW 2nd 197, Nebraska, 2001, City Slickers Incorporated v. Dow Glass, 40 SW 3rd 805, ARC. Court. App 2001. On the other hand, most states enforce non-competes. In ADP, LLC v. Rafferty, 923 F 3rd 113, 3rd C 2019, the court held that the preservation of client relationships and goodwill was a legitimate business justification for preventing competition by departing employees. If a non-competition agreement is overbroad, should the courts refuse to enforce it at all, or should they narrow it to make it enforceable? Compare Coleman v. Retina Consultants, 687 SE 2nd 457, Georgia, 2009, refusing to reform unenforceable agreement, and Nev. Reverend, Stat. 613.200, barring judicial reformation of problematic non-compete agreements, with ADP, LLC v. Rafferty, 923 F 3rd 113, 3rd C 2019, holding that overbroad agreements should be blue-penciled edited by the courts to make them reasonable. 2. There seems to be no question in the CTI court's mind that none of the defendants misappropriated any CTI trade secrets, infringed any copyrights, or otherwise took anything belonging to CTI and starting software artisans. Why doesn't that dispose of the case? What social purpose is served by enjoining former employees from pursuing their livelihood? Shouldn't the mobility and liberty of individuals be the paramount consideration, as California courts have suggested? 3. California courts have interpreted this statute to ban on competition agreements altogether in employee contracts, but to permit such agreements if they are ancillary to the sale of a business, so long as the terms of the agreement are reasonable. See Monogram Indus Incorporated v. Sar Indus Incorporated, 64 calories. App 3rd 692, 134 calories. RPTR 714, 718, 1976. 
Further, while California courts will not enforce a non-competition agreement, they will prevent departing employees from using or disclosing their former employer's trade secrets. See State Farm Mutual Automobilins. Covey. Dempster. 344 p. 2nd 821. Cal. Court. At 1959. Gordon v. Landor. 49 calories 2nd 690. 321 p. 2nd 456. California. 1958. Other states, including Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, Montana, and North Dakota, also forbid non-competition agreements. Still other states, including Colorado, Delaware, Massachusetts, and Tennessee, forbid them in professional settings, but allow them in other contexts. C. For instance, Murphy Spromed, Clinic v. Udom, 166 SW 3rd 674, Tennessee, 2005, but see Central Indiana Podiatry PCV. Kruger, 882 NE 2nd 723, I'm 2008, non-compete agreement enforceable against physician of reasonable. 4. The strength of California's commitment to the free movement of employees was demonstrated in the application group incorporated v. The Hunter Group Incorporated, 72 calories. RPTR 2nd 73, Court. At 1998, there, the California Court of Appeals held that 16,600 precluded the enforcement of a non-competition agreement entered into in Maryland between a Maryland employer and employee, where the employee subsequently left to take a job telecommuting from Maryland for a California company. Despite the fact that Maryland courts would enforce the agreement, the California court concluded that California's interests were materially stronger than Maryland's in this case. See also Savvy. Playhead Incorporated, 85 calories. At 4th 927, 102 calories. RPTR 2nd 495, 2000. Disregarding choice of law provision, in holding a non-compete agreement unenforceable, California's strong public policy has led to conflicts with other states. The most notable example is advanced by Onyx v. Medtronic, 87 calories. At 4th 1235, 2001, in which both California and Minnesota courts asserted that their law should control, with the Minnesota court enjoining the departing employee and the California court enjoining the employer from proceeding with the suit, the California Supreme Court ultimately reversed, not because it didn't consider the policy of employee mobility important, but because it thought the specter of conflicting judgments unseemly. Advanced by Onyx v. Medtronic, 29 calories 4th 697, 128 calories. RPTR 2nd 172, 2002, but the California court's deference to a sister court may simply subjugate California's policy to the law of any other state that would enforce a non-compete agreement, even if the employee doesn't work in that state. CIBM Corp v. The Jorak, 191 F 3rd 1033, 9C 1999, applying New York law to enjoin competition against New York company by employee in California, and disregarding California policy to the contrary. Amazon.com Incorporated v. Powers, 2012 WL 6726538, WD Wash. December 27, 2012, enforcing Washington choice of law clause in non-compete contract against employee who left Amazon.com to work for Google in California. For a contrary ruling giving nationwide effect to a refusal to enforce a non-compete agreement under Georgia law, see Palmer and Kiwi. Martian McLennan, 404 F3rd 1297, 11th C 2005, is there a reason way to resolve such conflicts in public policy, or will the inevitable result be a race to the courthouse? After advanced bionics, California enacted Cal. Labor Code 925, which prohibits employers from requiring California-based employees to agree to litigate their non-competes outside the state. That suggests California remains strongly committed to protecting its employees against non-competes. 5. What are the competing policy interests at stake in non-competition clauses? On the one hand, it seems unfair to employers to simply allow their employees to do whatever they want upon leaving. Particularly where the employees were in positions of importance, their knowledge of the employer's trade secrets may leave a former employer at a competitive disadvantage. In a competitive industry, preventing the disclosure of trade secrets is far preferable to suing for misappropriation after they have already been disclosed. A non-competition agreement may be a reasonable way for an employer to prevent a problem and a lawsuit before it starts. On the other hand, such restrictions seem onerous burdens to impose on employees. Imagine how you would feel as an attorney if you left a firm only to find that you were prevented from practicing law in the same field or geographic region for the next two years. In this regard, it is significant that even Reed Roberts expressed the view that the learned professions were properly subject to non-competition agreements. In addition, it is not completely clear that such provisions benefit companies in the long run. Strawman, the defendant in Reed Roberts, came to Reed Roberts after having worked for a competitor for four years. He was hired, in part because of his valuable experience in the industry. What if Strawman's former employer had required him to sign an enforceable non-compete agreement? For scholarly criticism of enforcing non-competes, see Charles Take Graves, analyzing the non-competition covenant as a category of intellectual property regulation. 3 Hastings C. and Tech. LJ 69, 2010. Some scholars have suggested that there is a more practical economic motivation for precluding such non-competition agreements. They argue that the relative success of California's Silicon Valley compared to Boston's Route 128 is directly attributable to the prevalence of non-competition agreements in Route 128 companies, which prevented the free movement of employees, and therefore discouraged startup companies. 
See Oli Lobel, talent wants to be free, why we should learn to love leaks, raids, and free riding. 2015, Ronald J. Gilson, the legal infrastructure of high technology industrial districts, Silicon Valley, Route 128, and covenants not to compete, 74 NYUL Reverend 575. 1999, Annalise Saxenian, Regional Advantage, Culture, and Competition in Silicon Valley and Route 128, 1994, 6. When a firm requires an existing employee to sign an employment agreement containing a covenant not to compete, the employee is giving up something substantial. What is the employer giving up? Some cases have raised the issue of consideration. In the contract law sense, in such an agreement on the part of the employer, they generally conclude that there is consideration, on one theory or another. C. For instance, Central Adjustment Bureau v. Ingram, 678 SW 2nd 28, Tennessee, 1984, consideration in the form of continuous employment over a long period of time, Alex Shishunov MGMT, serves v. Johnson, 209 SW 3rd 644, 646, Texas, 2006, same, rejecting prior Texas case law, Lake Landemp, GRPV. Columba, 804 any second 27, Ohio, 2004, consideration in the form of continuing to employ an at-will employee, three justices dissented, why not require, out of fairness, that an employer who insists on such a covenant must pay the employee's salary during the term of the non-compete provision, several other nations follow this approach, Germany, the German commercial code requires, that an employer compensate the employee for the complete duration of time, that the covenant is in effect up to a maximum duration of two years, see Wendy S. Lazar and Gary Arsenescalco, EDS, restrictive covenants and trade secrets in employment law, an international survey volume i 17 to 5 2010 german commercial code 74 1 compensation must be at least half of the employee's pay during the previous 12 months of employment china in 2008 china adopted a similar regime cprc labor contract law of the 1st of january 2008 articles 23 to 24 2008 employers may include non-compete restrictions of no more than two years in employment agreements with senior technicians senior managers and other employees who have access to trade secrets under the law, the employer must compensate the employee throughout the post-employment non-compete period, although the law does not specify the compensation level. It is unclear whether the compensation must be at the prior level, or can be as low as minimum wage. United Kingdom, the UK employs a garden leave policy, under which the employee must provide the employer with a long notice period before changing employment. The employer is required to pay full salary and benefits during this period, but cannot force the employee to work. The employee can stay at home, and tend his or her garden. The garden leave period must be reasonable under the circumstances of the employment. Some US companies have adopted such approaches on a voluntary basis. See Markham Corp v. Orchard, 885 F sub 294, D Massachusetts, 1995, enforcing a contractual provision preventing Orchard from working for any competitor in the country for one year, provided that Markham paid 110% of the salary offered by the competitor. See Sonia P. Passy, Compensated Injunctions, a more equitable solution to the problem of inevitable disclosure, 27 Berkeley Tech. LJ 927, 2012, suggesting such an approach. Is the employee likely to be satisfied by that approach? How employable will he be after sitting idle for two years? 7. Does the reasonableness of a non-compete agreement depend on the likelihood of trade secret misappropriation? In Zodiac Records Incorporated v. Choice and Serves, 112 so second 587, for court. App 2013, the court held that a three-year non-compete was unreasonable and violated due process where the plaintiff stipulated that it could not show that the defendant would use its trade secrets unless the agreement was enforced. 8. Can an employer avoid state laws restricting non-competition agreements by requiring the employee to sign an agreement that does not forbid employment but calls for the payment of a liquidated damage penalty if the employee goes to work for a competitor? Is such a monetary penalty effectively the same as enforcing a non-compete? What if the employer doesn't forbid employment but conditions the grant of stock options on not going to work for a competitor? CADP, LLC v. Rafferty, 923 F 3rd 113, 3rd C 2019, upholding such a condition. Note that it is common in high-tech industries to grant employees stock options that vest over a period of years, giving the employee an incentive not to leave and abandon the unvested options. 9. Despite their unenforceability, many employers in California require employees to sign non-compete agreements. CJJ, Prescott and others, understanding non-competition agreements. The 2014 non-compete survey project, 2016 Mitch. Street L Reverend 369, employees who do not know that the agreements are unenforceable might be deterred from going to work for a competitor or starting their own business. Should employers that knowingly require unenforceable agreements face some penalty for doing so? Underscore 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 under